name is Sandroy, and I first want to acknowledge uh, some of my co-authors, uh, the notorious story holder, Tom McCollum at CU Boulder Lasp, and Mark Alperin at UNC Chapel Hill. also want to acknowledge my funding source, Rock Powered Life, not only for money, but for their patience in building a very cool community around subsurface life. So Rika this morning and, uh, and Laurie just now made a really good explanation as to uh, explaining the value of subsurface biology or geomicrobiology to assess the possibility of life on ocean worlds. So that's what I'm really interested in, is how can we quantify this concept of habitability for methanogens? And it's important because in the absence of oxygen, at least on Earth, uh, these, these subsurface environments are extremely devoid in energy. There's a really low energy environment, right? It's about six orders of magnitude that separate the energy available to photosynthesizers compared to chemosynthesizers. So it's really important to assess uh, well the energy in the subsurface. And the, uh, the, this, this connection between geology and, and biology has been made by many people during this conference, uh, this conference in particular connecting the process of serpentinization, which is this uh, reaction of water and rock, certainly not limited to the earth. And one of the cool byproducts of, uh, of this geochemical reaction is the production of hydrogen. And it also produces very alkaline water. And then the coupling is, is, is obvious by the fact that hydrogen is a great electron donor and bugs have figured out how to use it to uh, reduce CO2 to methane. But Deb Kelly warned us in some of her Lost City papers that organisms living in vents, so in this case uh, Lost City type vents, must be adapted to a low dissolved inorganic carbon, CO2 poor and hydrogen rich environment. So why is, it, why is it CO2 poor? Well, the reason is, is that carbon speciates as a function of pH. So in this plot on the x-axis is concentration of carbon. The numbers don't mean much for this, for this particular talk. And on the x-axis is pH. So in regions of, uh, of acidic fluids, carbon preferentially speciates into CO2, whereas in circumneutral pH, carbon preferentially speciates into bicarbonate, and in alkaline pH, carbon preferentially speciates into carbonate. So in alkaline environments, that such that accompany those of active serpentinization, the CO2 concentrations are really poor. Now, is that important? Well, let, let me illustrate this in, an, in another plot. Here, I plot hydrogen concentrations on the y-axis and uh, CO2 concentrations on the x-axis. And these black squares here are kind of a collection from the literature of sites of methanogenesis, right? Rumen guts, uh, rice soils, uh, swamps, so lakes sediments, just kind of a collection, and they all plot down here, high CO2, low hydrogen, whereas sites of active sympathization, again, a collection from the literature, Chromo, Lossity, Oman, Cedars, and Tablelands, um, they all have high hydrogen, more or less, and very low CO2. So everything that we know about methanogenesis is done with, with bugs that we can sample easily, and those are uh, hydrogen limited, whereas when we seek to understand life in, uh, in serpentinization environments, well, those are hydrogen limited, and that's important difference. I also plot up here uh, a hypothetical culture of, met of methanogens. Um, typically, when we put them in test tubes, we blast them with a lot of CO2 and a lot of hydrogen so that they're happy. So again, what we know about methanogens comes from uh, a physical chemical space that is not expected in, in the serpentinization environments. So then how do we assess the, energeti the energetics available for these systems? Uh, allow me a quick 30-second bioenergetic primer. Some of you may be astronomers in the room, I don't know, but imagine a bug as a light bulb on the seafloor, and the reason why it shines is because it's connected to a battery. A battery provides a voltage that enables the flow of charge carriers or a current. The product of the voltage and the current is the power. And in the natural environments, the analogy is such that the voltage is the Gibbs free energy that we can calculate from the local conditions. And so the Gibbs free energy is the energy made available by an environment for the bugs to do work, right? So if we plot the same sites as I showed earlier, just with their uh, delta G, uh, so on the y-axis and the only axis is the, is the Gibbs free energy here, which is the negative of the affinity. The earlier, to, earlier this week, there were many talks about the affinity. It's the same thing as the Gibbs free energy, just the sign is swapped. Anything that's more negative than about minus 10 is considered energetically favorable, right? So in black, again, is our sites of classical methanogenesis, all below minus 10, all very happy and quantifiably uh, favorable for methanogenesis using this metric. And the sites of active serpentinization are, some of them are even more favorable for, for using this metric uh, for, for methanogenesis. 
But this is not the full story, right? You cannot describe the electrical properties of a light bulb with voltage alone. You need to understand the current as well. So the, the, the point of this presentation, perhaps, is to encourage all of you who think about energetics in these natural systems to go beyond delta G to, uh, to, th to, to, to assess whether or not an environment can host life. So let me ha hammer that one more time. Delta G is calculated from bulk values only, right? But cells consume carbon and hydrogen. So the, the concentration inside the cell is different than the bulk. Therefore, the delta G inside the cell is also different. But a cell is complicated, right? It, how do you take into account what is the physics that brings the material inside the cell? What about the effects of a cell membrane? What about the enzymatic rates that convert the carbon from CO2 to methane? All those things are important. That's, that's where systems biology comes, comes in handy. So we've used a... Um, a uh, single cell reactive transfer model developed by Alperin and Holler in 2009 that takes diffusion as the, as the mass transport mechanism because we're working with simple molecules like CO2 and hydrogen. They just diffuse through the, through the membrane. The reaction rates are simulated using monode kinetics. That's the plot on the right I'll talk about in a sec. And uh, we can take into account the, uh, the, the membrane, right, which kind of slows down the diffusion process. So the, uh, the, the, the reaction rates is kind of the monode kinetic reaction here. You can see that enzymes saturate on the x-axis is the concentration, on the y-axis is the rates. This is the same plot to, to illustrate that there's only so much pizza you can feed graduate students before they saturate, right? <laughs> so on the x-axis is, uh, is, is pizza. On the y-axis here is a rate at which they can eat it. The KM here is a kinetic parameter, also known as the, 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 the budget of the department. So from what they see, I'm taking this analogy way too far, sorry. But anyways, the, 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 the curve, the grass agent and the, uh, and the methanogen is the same, right? Just the, uh, the kinetic parameters uh, are different for obvious reasons. So if you take this, 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 uh, this, this, this enzymatic rate, that's the current, right? The amount of material going into the cell per unit time. So multiply that by the delta G that's inside the cell, you get a power. So instead of looking at delta G from the bulk environment alone, you can look at energetics from a 2D, 2D perspective. On the x-axis is the same as before, that delta G, and on the y-axis is that power I was telling you about. And this changes the story a little bit, right? What you can see here is all the sites of classical methanogenesis are on the right of a, of a boundary and on the sites of active sympathization on, on the left. And this boundary here is, uh, is a measurement of minimum flux to enable biological uh, turnover and calculated completely independently uh, from sulfate reducers in the Aarhus Bay uh, from in Alp, uh, Holler and Jurgensen 2013. So this is a very different conclusion than looking at just delta G alone, right? Looking at delta G alone, sites of active sympathization were awesome for life. Using this perspective, you don't expect methanogens to be, uh, to be present in, in sites of active sympathization. So, <laughs> so how do you reconcile that? So there was a great talk earlier, this app on by Emily Krauss, uh, who, who, who shows that there is such methanogens. So, so how do you reconcile the two? So before we, we try and think about that, let me just make two, two points uh, regarding uh, Gibbs free energy. First, high hydrogen in serpentinizing, in serpentinizing systems can, can fool you, right? They, they are, from that perspective alone, the, these sites are energetically favorable. However, when thinking about the power requirements of a, of a cell, then the, the, the energy scenario is, is, is different. So how, did, how do we then reconcile the results with observation of methanogens in serpentinizing systems? So here comes the disadvantage of giving a Friday talk, is that you have to accumulate everything that comes during the week, <laughs> and it can alter your conclusions a little bit. So. Um, yeah, so, 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 we, so to reconcile this, we can use the same modeling approach that, we, that uh, I, I showed you earlier. Um, what if methanogens had enzymes that were on the, on the, on the membranes? Right? Instead of diffusing the material inside the cell, they would have those enzymes that would translate the CO2 to methane on the, ce on the cell itself. And preliminary calculations show that that, that improves things about 20%, right? which is not enough to, tr to, to cross that threshold. Alternatively, the cells could be using uh, bicarbonates, 
that could enter the cell through, uh, through porins, through ion channels. Bicarbonate is charged, so it cannot just diffuse inside the cell. So the pH inside the cell is neutral, roughly. So the, speciate, the bicarbonate would speciate back to CO2. So that, that could be an enhancement of CO2 inside the cell. But once you have CO2 inside the cell that's a higher concentration than outside, it diffuses right back out and not useful for, for uh, methanogenesis. So that doesn't seem to work either. We're exploring other solutions like formate and acetate and even CO2. There was a poster by Jackie Gordiel using methogenomics where she found, uh, I don't want to butcher her science, uh, carbon monoxide dehydrogenase in her met metagenome. So maybe that's, that's an avenue as well. Or um, there's this kin kinetic parameter to that might be different, right? In the, the kinetic parameters was the one is the grad student plot. Um, the one we chose for the model is from the literature, and the literature value is found from sites of active methanogens, methan methanogens that we know, that we know uh, today. But re remember this plot I showed in the beginning was hydrogen on the y-axis and CO2 on the x-axis. Um, here I plot that Km value, the kinetic parameter for CO2 and hydrogen. And uh, the, the equation for power is in fact inversely proportional to the sum of that Km plus CO2. Now for sites of active methanogenesis, this ratio is controlled by the concentration of CO2 alone, right? You could increase the power by decreasing that Km, but it won't do much because that ratio is set by the concentration of, uh, of CO2 for sites of kind of classical methanogenesis. However, that's not the case for sites of active serpentinization, right? That ratio is actually controlled by the Km value because the CO2 is so small. So you can perhaps think that the bugs have figured out how to drop their, the, their Km value by, say, an order of magnitude, because from that ratio, that would increase the power by an order of magnitude. And so I, I redid, those, redid the same calculations with delta G on the y-axis and power on the x-axis here. That's that same limit from uh, Alperin and Jorgensen in 2013, but with this different kinetic parameter. And you can see that some of the sites of uh, of active serpentization do become habitable from that perspective, right? We have almost all of them, except for two from Lost City, one from Oman, and so we're getting very close to, to that threshold. So perhaps that's an avenue, right? Bugs have evolved to have a different kinetic parameter that we do not observe in cultured experiments because we culture from sites that we can actively sample them. So this is kind of the two plots, so you can see with the Km from the literature versus kind of playing with, playing with the, the, that Km values to, to shift a little bit the, that perspective. So uh, that's it. I don't think there's any um, conclusions we can do at this point, but the energetics of, en of uh, environments that can host serpentinization, that can host methanogens through serpentinization is, is, I think, more tricky than has been traditionally thought of. Thank you. Time for a question for Sanjoy. Pressure. So obviously these guys are doing a lot of pressure environmentally. So how does that environmental factor layer into you know whether this metabolic whether you can have an enzyme in a membrane or um, the you were you mentioned earlier on your slides. So how does that factor? I don't know. Um, um, it's a good question. So the question is, how does, how does pressure affect the, uh, the enzyme kinetics? Um, um, I don't, I've not seen a study that took methanogens and puts them under high pressure and, that, and sees what the rates are different compared to traditional chemostats. I think that would be a really cool experiment. Hard, but really cool experiment. Yeah. Do you have a global view of, of uh, the production of methane through methanogenesis at circumcision sites versus I don't, but that's in the literature. I don't have that number off the top of my head. Hi, Sean. Hi. Um, thanks for the great talk. I had a question about where the Km value comes, whether or not it, it's from a methanogen with cytochromes or one without cytochromes. And that, that's a really simple question. You can answer that in a word. But the other point I wanted to raise was I wonder how your model results compare against the data with hydrogen concentration thresholds because it used to be thought that the Km was the control of how much, what's the lowest concentration of hydrogen in solution these methanogens could grow on. But later on, it kind of seems like it panned out that it turns, it, it boils down to the bioenergetics of how much energy it takes to pump a single ion across the membrane during mm -hmm. 
uh, chemiosmosis. Right. So I was, I was wondering, have you mapped that onto the hydrogen question too, and if that could help you understand your results? So that, that, that threshold is at minus 10 kilojoules. Um, yeah. So I think what well, we've seen in, in, in environments that, it, that, that energetic value is much, much, much more negative than that. Um, I guess I'm not understanding your question very well. But <laughs> we can talk late, later, yeah. sorry. And how about the KM? Where is the KM from? Is it from cy a, cy a cytochrome containing methanogen, like sarsenolase, or is it from like a methanococcoides? I don't remember. Okay. But I, I have the paper. <laughs> I'll, yeah. I'll check for that. Thanks, sorry. Thanks, Sean. <laughs> Let's thank Sanjay one more time. <laughs>